Welcome to the Cloud Pod, where the forecast is always cloudy. We talk weekly about all things AWS, GCP, and Azure. We are your hosts, Justin, Jonathan, Ryan, and Matthew. Episode 223, recorded for August 9th, 2023. Get AWS spin on savings with cost optimization flywheel. Good evening, Matt, Jonathan, and Ryan. Full house tonight. Hey, Justin. All right. It's nice to see everyone here. Yeah, I mean, between vacations and summertime, it's it's hard to get everyone in the same room. But uh, you know, I, you guys did dodge a bullet because I was going to go on vacation again in October, and I canceled it, so you didn't have to try to try to get two episodes out while I was gone. <laughs> so you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> With our stunning track record on those, I, I you know, I, I see it. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> uh, well, we uh, we don't have any AWS news today, and. I think it's the third time in the history of the podcast that we have no news, which just tells you that we are we are clearly getting closer to announcement season. Like GCP is at the end of this month. You've got Oracle in September. Then you got reInvent in November. So you know, everyone's starting to uh, look at those stories and like, is that going to be something I can either spin with AI and announce now, <laughs> or is it something I'm going to hold back for reInvent or one of these other conferences? So. Uh, but you know, Google, uh, who has been kind of vacant from the podcast a little bit, has uh, several new things for us this week. So they're filling in the gap for AWS, which I appreciate. So thank you, Google. It's one of the few times you've helped me out recently. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and introducing uh, new SQL functions to manipul- your, manipulate your JSON data in BigQuery, which is always my favorite thing, to manipulate your data lake with SQL. Enterprises are generating data at exponential rate, spanning traditional structured transactional data, semi-structured data like JSON, and unstructured data like images and audio. Beyond the scale, the divergent types of presented processing challenges for developers, sometimes requiring a separate processing flow for each of the different data types to be standardized. The query, of course, supported semi-structured JSON at launch, eliminating the need for processing and providing schema flexibility, intuitive querying, and scalability of benefits afforded to structured data. But all of those pesky developers still wanted SQL. <laughs> they still want to modify things with SQL Server because that's what they know. They're not SQL Server, they're just SQL. And so Google is now releasing SQL functions for BigQuery, JSON, extending the power and flexibility of their core JSON support. These new functions make it easier to extract and construct JSON data and perform complex data analysis. And the three options they give you, if you don't have, if it's one of these three, I'm sorry, you're not in luck. Number one, convert JSON values into primitive types like int64, float64, bool, and string. Sort of uh, feel insulted by the thing that string is a primitive. Like, it's not primitive. That's everything in an easier, more flexible way with the new JSON LAX functions and then easily update and modify an existing JSON value in BigQuery with new JSON mutator functions. I can't just call it JSON update, but no, no, we're going to go mutator because we like to make our compliance people cry and construct JSON objects and JSON array with SQL in BigQuery with new JSON constructor functions or JSON inserts. So there you go. I think we should let Justin just do the lightning round by himself as he <laughs> describes the topics. It's just so perfect. I can't even like, argue. I mean, what have we learned in the, the vast history of, you know, throwing compute functions in the database layer? Like, nah, sure. What could go wrong? <laughs> I think it's, I think I just thought, oh, go on. I was going to say something positive. I mean, if you want to like... <laughs> <laughs> over hey, different ahead. podcast, Jonathan. That's a different. Um. <laughs> I was just saying, I feel like you know everything has to have SQL. You know, you know, on top of JSON, you know, you have no SQL with SQL mm-hmm. commands on top of it that they program. Just you know, getting anyone to learn anything else but SQL seems to be uh, extremely difficult in life. Well, I mean, you only know that a NoSQL solution makes it. Once it gets a SQL interface, that's how you know it's truly come web scale. Yeah, uh, but yeah, you know, it is sort of humorous to me because uh, I know many, many companies and places that take like an Oracle database, and then they uh, extract all this data and put it onto a Kafka queue, and then insert that into a data lake, and then do all this processing, and you know, all of that operation costs hundreds of thousands of dollars per day, and then they put a Trino interface on top of it to query it with SQL because. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> because it's too hard to <laughs> learn new methods and new patterns. Uh, and so, yeah, so that's a, it's a very common uh, thing. And I don't, it does seem to be like we should come up with something better than SQL. But apparently, no one wants to learn anything but SQL. I'm going to pimp our interview that we did with the Couchbase CTO, Ravi Mayorum, because we talked a lot about the SQL interface to the NoSQL stuff. And it was a really interesting chat with him. 
um, you know, he kind of likened it to, you know, you don't build a car that doesn't have a steering wheel and, and pedals. You can try, but people are used to that kind of thing, and that's that's the interface they they expect when they go and drive a car. Same with databases; everyone's everyone's familiar with it. It's a comprehensive language; it makes makes a lot of sense. Um, I still think there's room for improvement, but I actually think the um, like the ability to con to construct JSON objects from data in BigQuery is pretty useful because if you think about any kind of web UI, any any kind of uh, visual interface is uh, most likely going to be using JSON objects to rendering tables or graphs or something else. So actually having that natively constructed in BigQuery is, is pretty cool. It just saves having to do that externally. I've also recently learned um, how to curate a data set with a lot more like functions like these so that I'm not doing it all at the presentation layer for like BI purposes. And I'm starting to understand why all the BI engineers I've met in my career are, are sort of angry. Um, and so it's, it's like, okay, this is starting to make sense. You know, it's, uh, it's like a lot of these things you, you can, they're useful because you can put the, you can put the, the, the type of data you need in the right layer. It's just one of those things to be aware of where you don't want to do all the computation or you have to balance the computation of the data set. All right. Well, outages happen to everyone, of course, and especially Google when your AZs aren't really separate AZs. <laughs> Uh, and so Google is excited to introduce personalized service health, which provides fast, transparent, relevant, and actual communication about Google Cloud service disruptions. It's in preview. It allows you to receive granular alerts about Google Cloud service disruptions as a stop in your incident response or integrate with your incident response or monitoring tools. Today, when there is an issue, they publish it to a Google Cloud service health page, which is publicly available. But with a personalized service health, they take this out further by allowing you to decide service disruptions relevant to you. Uh, which I would think they could figure out for me, but that's okay. Integration with your incident manager workflow via PagerDuty or other tools and personalized service health emits logs that you can push customizable alerts to make incidents more discoverable for your workflow. So you can now get all the logs from Google directly into your observability tool to increase your observability costs even more. It's great. <laughs> appreciate that. You can guess how that product turned out or started out. I guess it's, how do we not tell customers that we have all these outages? Ah, let's make a personalized dashboard that they actually have to configure before it shows anything. Yes, yeah. uh, it must be great to have like the the, bl the blink of view of things that only affect you, uh, instead yeah. of seeing like holistically the problems across the whole platform. And so now I can tell Ryan when he has to enable new services in the CCOE that he has to now add them to the personalized service health dashboard if they're enabled by our company. So you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's more work for Ryan is how I see it. Because now the only way we can use it is if we Hey, man, here. if you want me to parse an event, I can parse an event all day and night. I, I, I think that's the big improvement over this is that, you know, historically it's, a, it's been a poll-based sort of list from the service health dashboard. And now it's publishing an event and I'm just giving a criteria of which events I want. Oh, yeah. Take this. Yeah. I mean, I do appreciate it. I just don't know why they can't figure it out for me. I think, isn't Amazon's personalized health, which this is a copycat feature of, doesn't it? figure out what's running in your account and then give you relevant health dashboards based on it? Or is it, is it something I have to configure too? It's, eh, it's, it's exactly the same. All right, fair enough. Like I, I, it was still in preview last time I played with it, but like... Um, no, I think it only tells you the services that you're using. I thought that was the whole pitch to it. Was that, yeah, we, we scan your account and we know what you're using because of the bill and that's how I thought it works. Yeah, I think that's what theirs is. So that's the trick, though, is because when you are you doing it at the organization level or are you doing it at the per account level? And so it's like, yes, at an account level, that's exactly what it does. But at an organization level, no, not so much. Well, that's because organizations is a bolt on feature for AWS that they're still making it work. Yep. I mean, you said making it work like you were serious about that. But <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not entirely convinced that any of the organization stuff is really well thought out still. And it's still a bolt on in many, many ways. I mean, they, they do have org policies, which is helpful and, and that works okay. Uh, but like I was just reading a blog post about these people who are moving their, you know, 20 accounts from their old legacy uh, AWS account structure to a new account structure because they wanted to have an immutable backup account, but they wanted it to be tied to a single root. But the way they had it, because they were a startup, of course, they had one root account that became the organizational master. And so they wanted to move on and they were, Walking through, like, yeah, the problem is, you know, you have to have a credit card on each account and you have to have an email address. And then, you know, and some, and then like they're, <laughs> to make it worse for them though, there are some like, you know, I think they're an international company. I don't know where they're at, like Indonesia or Philippines, something like that. So they don't just have credit cards. Like we have credit cards that just apply to Amazon. You have to do more complicated things. 
And uh, but yeah, it still sounds awful. So I was reading through it. I was like, yeah, I remember shutting down accounts was kind of like this and awful. Uh, and it apparently hasn't got much better. So well, now they have an API to shut down accounts, which is nice. Yeah. And last last time I've I've changed accounts into from one org to another. I, so I wonder. You have to still do a credit card. Yes, you have to detach it from the organizational master that it used to be part of, and then attach it to the new one. Yeah, but if you send yeah. the invite first from the new org, nope. you can't send an nope. invite. The last I knew, you can't send the invite until it's already been detached or it's not going to receive it. Maybe they fixed that since then, but I did this probably two years ago now, and that was a limitation. And then that credit card obviously gets charged like four cents, even if you do it in like three seconds, which is always fun. Well, I'm sure not going to go test this by migrating my personal account between orgs, just in case it is painful. And there's no other way to test it. So, <laughs> What's more fun is playing with GovCloud on AWS. Oh, I've heard stories. That is, <laughs> that is a load of fun because every... There's this whole convoluted thing where, like, where you tell it to create a GovCloud account, and then you have to wait and query it until it gives you the account number, and then you can log in, and then that gets tied to the original org, the GovCloud org, not the non-GovCloud org, but it's a one-to-one ratio of GovCloud to non-GovCloud because all the billing is done through non-GovCloud. And if you actually understand this, I, I wish you luck because that means you're in that world, and I've had to be in this world before, and. It is fascinating and horrifying at the same time. Well, I mean, having now I mean, going through a FedRAMP pre-assessment and going through that and talking about what's in your boundary versus what's not in your boundary. And Amazon smartly probably said to themselves, hmm, the billing system, we shouldn't have it in our boundary because <laughs> that's yep. going to be terrible. And that's why you're in that terrible scenario. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Because they don't have to give actually any customer identifiable data. They don't have to get any government metadata in that level. That all they have to do is provide mm-hmm. the account number and the service and the billing metric, and they pass that to commercial. Then they don't have to worry about any of their billing system having to know any of that. So it's well yeah. well played on the boundary there, Amazon. Well, so it's like a, a shadow account that actually receives the billing information for the actual Correct. cloud account. But you can actually use that account completely and as a normal account, and then it really confuses people, oh, wow. which has definitely never happened before. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, so I was I was peeking around here while you were talking about GovCloud and the, and the horror of it. And uh, apparently in 2021, they renamed the AWS Health thing to AWS Health Aware, which they now have the acronym AHA. <laughs> it's sort of like, <laughs> like, oh, okay. And it does it does look at EventBridge. It does use EventBridge to send you eventing if you want that mm-hmm. as well. And then uh, it has a bunch of things around you know, communication with Slack and Amazon and Teams, integration with EventBridge. Uh, ability to do prescriptive guidance on AWS Health, and then a bunch of other things there too. Which is cool. So, yeah, you know, it's a yeah, it is a little more customized uh, to uh, your account and what your account is doing versus uh, your system. And it does have an organizational health view as well, which requires a massive amount of configuration. Because I I clicked on it and I realized I didn't want to do that because it's going to cost me a lot of money. So. <laughs> So yeah, I knew we'd find a way to get to Amazon in the uh, in the podcast today. There we yeah, go. we knew we'd be here in a way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of Amazon talk for a Google topic, yeah. Yep. Well, you know, because you just generated all that new health data, you might want to put it somewhere. Maybe that place is Prometheus, because somehow you built a Kubernetes connector that you receives those hooks, and then I don't know how you it actually ended up in Prometheus, but you did somehow. And it's costing you an arm and a leg. <laughs> uh, Google has uh, now given you a discount on that. So they are dropping the price of sample ingestion effective immediately to 60%. Uh, so they do have this in tiering models. So the first zero to 50 billion samples used to cost you six cents. And now it only costs you a penny and a half, which is 60% savings. Uh, and it scales down from there. Uh, so you can get the best deal for your business, which is nice if you're trying to do Kubernetes monitoring in an easily way without burdening your engineers with those pesky, pesky metrics. That's a lot of samples. 50 billion samples a month. That's a lot of samples. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at the above 500 billion samples. Yeah. That's a lot too. 200,000 samples per second. Could you imagine? That's a massive system. Yeah. I mean, I'm also thinking like what <laughs> Kubernetes says you shouldn't have more than 200,000 pods. That's like a whole so, you know, in one cluster. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. It's for uh, most companies, it should not be, it shouldn't be that high. I have been at that company too, where it was that high. That was not because of good architecture or efficiency in architecture. No. 
<laughs> no. I always wonder what they do on the back end to get such a good price reduction. And then my next question is, how long has it been there that they haven't given me the price reduction that they've been making that much profit on it? Well, I, you had, I was wondering these things too, is like, is the reason why they're not, people aren't adopting it is because it's too expensive. And is it really a, a, a margin builder for them or is it that they weren't getting any revenue from it? So now they have an opportunity to get more revenue because customers are now not saying, ooh, that's too expensive. Hmm. And maybe maybe it's the AWS method of like we're going to make this relatively expensive, so we control basically the velocity of adoption, right? Because it's it makes you think, you know, a penny and a half, depending on how many transactions you have, um, versus you know something with two two zeros. You know, maybe it's it's just to slow that roll while you build out the infrastructure for it. I don't know. I mean, considering how detached most people who set this up are from the billing. I mean, if you're in yeah. Kubernetes, you're already like three steps away from the cloud. I don't know that they even think about this <laughs> until it's too late and the, the CFO's hair is on fire going, how do you spend how much? On what? Yeah, you're probably right. I've never seen someone like, let's use Prometheus and then be cost aware about that choice. Like that's not, that those two things don't happen normally. I, I mean, t- tell me somebody who's using Kubernetes who's like super cost aware. <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> Have you been waiting months and months to hire your new AWS, GCP, or Azure architect only to have them be poached at the 11th hour by a startup with a juice bar? Initiatives stalled because you're having trouble hiring? Well, I have a simple solution, Falcon Consulting. Falcon Consulting provides top-notch cloud engineers to the world's most innovative companies and can be burning down your DevOps and cloud backlogs as soon as next week. Falcon certified AWS, GCP, and Azure professionals are armed with infrastructure as code and from day one will be designing performant, optimized cloud native or hybrid environments that deliver on the promise of cloud. Their FogOps solution even provides on demand cloud engineering to augment your existing teams. Visit www.foghornconsulting.com or send an email to cloudtalentnow at foghornconsulting.com and tell them the CloudPod sent you. Your dedicated FogOps team is with you for the long haul. And they bring their own juice. All right. Well, Azure has one story for us this week. The Azure Storage Mover, which I think is a great name, can now migrate your SMB shares to Azure File Shares. This is a fully managed migration service that enables you to migrate on-premise files to folders in Azure Storage with a minimizing downtime for your workload. So it's basically rsync, but managed. I was going to say RoboCopy, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, wrong OS there, Justin. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Wait, well, you know, they embraced Linux at Microsoft, right? So they probably learned that Robocopy was terrible compared to rsync. Just use rsync now. <laughs> at least I just think so. There are so many worse things besides Robocopy that I don't even know. Oh, yeah. Know oh, yeah. <laughs> there was a, Please start listing them off. My, <laughs> my very first company I ever worked in, that was a, my first SaaS company. We used to replicate between three servers all of this, all of the learning content. And we use vice versa. <laughs> it was a Windows GUI application. <laughs> and uh, you had to configure it and do all this stuff. And it was way, way, way before people even knew what DevOps was. It was like, yeah, we're going to go configure this vice versa app that costs like $40 per server. We installed it on. It was ridiculous. But it did the job. And then we replaced it with RoboCopy because I got mad at it one day. This is my Windows SME days. So. Maybe I'm like overthinking this, but what's, what's so hard about selecting all the files in one window and dragging them to another window? <laughs> One's in, the, one's in the cloud. Ma- managing interruptions. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. And keeping them in sync. And if you're like having something that's building something, you know, and then you want to copy that up, you know, in real time or near real time. So if something's putting files there and then you want to back them up or something like that, you could in theory use this as like an offsite DR and like your network file share or something. Ryan has a similar use case for this right now that he would not drag and drop from left to right, I can tell you. It's much bigger number of files than that. <laughs> it is. And none of them are needed. Got to move them anyway. Woo, compliance. Yeah. Compliance. <laughs> I have an Oracle story for us this week. No AWS, but Oracle showed up to the party. Uh, and they are pleased to announce the latest addition to the Oracle Distributed Cloud Portfolio, which I don't know what that portfolio includes, but here we go. We have a new addition. The Oracle Compute Cloud at Customer. Not, uh, it's not AT, it's ampersand. Yeah, no, sorry, I'm saying it. Whatever that at symbol is, it looks like an A with a little circle around it. At customer. 
a fully managed rack scale infrastructure platform that lets organizations run enterprise and cloud native workloads on Oracle Cloud infrastructure. It's built, installed, owned, and remotely managed by Oracle, so you can focus your scarce IT resources on growing your business and improving operation operating efficiency. Uh, and it's built on top of the fourth generation AMD Epic processor with 96 cores per processor and DDR5 memory. And you can subscribe in increments of 552 available processor cores with 6.7 terabytes of available memory, up to a maximum of 6,624 cores overall. I'd like to point out that this is 3.8 times the number of cores per rack as an AWS Outpost system and 1.4 times the densest Microsoft Azure stack hub systems. And Oracle, unlike Amazon, wisely decided to give you only the pricing by cost per core and not by the num- actually the monthly price you will pay for this unit. And they like to point out that their cost is $53 per month per core for 2,208 cores <laughs> uh, in the rack and uh, 143 per month for AWS Outposts with only 576 cores and the Azure Stack Hub, which is a third-party service you buy from Dell or HP and then you install Azure on top of. The maximum configuration you can get on that guy is 1,536 uh, cores. And of course, it's not cloud miles, so they have no pricing for that. Uh, and I always like think is, wow, that sun investment for them is still paying off in some weird ways sometimes. That's $121,000 a month. Yes, it is. <laughs> but you can have Oracle Cloud in your data center, which you know, my biggest thought was like, yeah, you're going to just invite Oracle into your data center where they're going to install, own, and remotely manage this system that's now in your network, in your data center, and you're not going to worry about getting audited every day. <laughs> <laughs> this is, I'll just set up a PO for the licensing audits. Just just bill me to the audit PO. Please. Yeah, that's 50% more expensive than, than the outpost. Well, I assume... Uh, it's less cores on the outpost than it is on the... Yeah, but if you don't need 2,208 cores... Can you have? Then that's true. It sounds the right investment. Yeah, but then think about all the man hours you save not having to run the the, the auditing software in your data center. Because it's already running. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, so anytime someone uses at customer or at partner like this, I have horror stories back to the company I worked at where we did um, SaaS at partner, which was terrible. Where we basically took our SaaS application that we managed and we're like, we're going to go run it in a data center owned by a partner who's going to resell it. And that was terrible. Uh, and I did it twice with the same leader. The same guy came with the same dumb idea. Two different places. Failed both times. Yet I had to go implement it both times and have it fail. So great. Super awesome. I think Jonathan and I might have been involved in some of that project too with me. Mm-hmm. It was at the company we met. So <laughs> a little live research. The ad Holy symbol is called the ad symbol. Oh, okay. Well, there's no fancy name for it. <laughs> no fancy name. Because I, yeah. I always called the and symbol the and symbol, and they're like, no, that's an ampersand. Like, yeah, cool. yeah. I was totally expecting to find a real name, and no, nope. no, not at all. That's good. The most interesting part of the Oracle story is what is the at symbol called? <laughs> <laughs> oh, also in the uh, in the fifty three dollars per month, you get you get access to three point four petabytes of storage. So you have that as well. Who doesn't want petabytes of storage in the data center? Store all those Oracle licenses you need. (laughs) All right, let's move on to our cloud journey series. This week, uh, we have an article from AWS talking about the cost optimization flywheel, uh, which is your way to manage and reduce costs in the cloud. Uh, There are several key points in the article, including uh, four key steps. The analyze step, which involves gathering data and analyzing to identify areas where cost optimization is possible. The recommendation step, which includes includes using automated tools and machine learning algorithms to generate cost saving recommendations. The deploy step, involving implementing the recommended changes identified in the previous step. And the operate step, which is the final one, focusing on monitoring and measuring the impact of the changes made and adjusting strategies accordingly. AWS provides various services, tools, and resources to assist customers in each step of the cost optimization flywheel. And the article emphasizes the importance of a continuous iterative approach to cost optimization rather than the threading as a one-time effort. And also highlights the role of automation and machine learning to enable better outcomes. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is something Amazon's talked about for a long time, and it's a good idea because you know once you can start, you know, once you start identifying some ways to save money, you can get you know all that money you were spending with Amazon, you can now repurpose to paying for more people to get more cost savings, and then eventually it will be a flywheel that stops running because you've run out of opportunities to save money unless your company's going out of business. But it's a good a good initial approach, and there are typically multiple. Multiple trips around this wheel you can go on, uh, you know, from very simple things to like, hey, I'm going to delete all the disconnected storage that I 
accidentally deleted and didn't delete properly or release all those IP addresses I'm going to be paying for now because they're charging me for IPv4 addresses. Uh, those are easy wins, leading you then into you know more complicated things like enabling auto-scaling or spot instances, and then into more complicated architectural changes to your application to get more efficiency. I'm My not sure it's just, yeah, I think who, who wants to criticize first? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to be positive go on, you be, for once. <laughs> you be the fall guy. I was just saying, I feel like we... We talked about this, you know, a little bit on uh, one of the costs, you know, the cost of the cloud. And like, you know, we said there, look, the cloud is not cheaper, but if you leverage the services, it actually can, you know, help you innovate and, you know, do all those other fun things nice and quicker and better and cheaper. But cost savings is a perpetual thing um, that you always have to do. And that's kind of what this to me is kind of trying to get at the crux of is. You know, look at your environment perpetually, look at your bill, see what you're doing, you know, in the analyze phase, figure out what you want to do and go do it, you know, and see how you can decrease your costs, whether it's, hey, our SQL team told us that we needed these provisioned IOPS. Wait, we really don't need that. We're nowhere close to that. Or, hey, we have all these disconnected disks or, hey, we have these over provisioned Azure file shares, you know, that we don't need five terabytes of storage on when they're only using 200 gigabytes. You know, it, it's that perpetual, let's look at the environment. And it's, you know, why if for my team, you know, I always keep open like a cost savings epic because even if we've done everything, if you let the developers and you let things go haywire, like they're going to go off the deep end. And it's something you always have to be looking at in the cloud. I think some of those things are very, very, uh, like very anti-cloud, like you shouldn't have to provision five terabytes of storage to use 200 gigawatts. It should scale. Welcome to Azure. Exactly. I mean, that's that's the wrong cloud. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's supposed to be a consumption model, not a prepay model. Not not sign up for a, for a, I mean, you want to get discounts on something, then sure, sign up, sign a commitment for for a huge amount of storage and then use use what you need, but it's kind of, so in the rare occasion I defend Azure, this is if you have, uh, essentially it's the same thing as AWS with the, like you get X number of IOPS per gigabyte for GP2. They have the same process with Azure File Share for like DFS on AWS, where like, uh, or sorry, FSX on AWS, where you like, you get X number of gigabytes per IOPS. And if you need more IOPS, then you have to just provision more storage, uh, storage space. Hmm. It's more of an artifact of PyOps being too expensive, though, right? Then, like that's just the cost model. Like, yeah. so it's it's because you can achieve better results more cheaper by doing it that way versus you know how it's supposed to be, which is if I needed high high throughput, I should be able to check the box for PyOps. But it's so ridiculously expensive that it doesn't make sense to do so. But this is on like the FSX service, yeah. yeah. To give you context, I mean, GP three largely solved solved that because you could you could scale pyops yeah. and and uh, throughput in megabytes a second independently. But just in general, I don't like this blog post at all. I don't like the diagram. I don't like the write up. It's really amateurish. My uh, my eight year old could have drawn a better diagram than this. If you really want the proper diagram, go to the FinOps Foundation and look at their framework and the phases of their framework. They have basically the same thing: inform, optimize, and operate. Go around the little circle and a really nice cloud agnostic write up of, of, of the process that you should be following. Um, at least AWS mentioned the discounts you can get if you spend a lot of money, like or the, you know, the map discounts or the enterprise discounts and things like that. But I think a lot of people won't get those anyway. You uh, should uh, get your son to draw this diagram and I'll put it as the, as the cover art for the podcast episode. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I'd like to see him draw because yeah. I think he'd be good at it. I'm, you know, knowing him quite well, and I won't use his name because you know, it's not public information. But uh, I think he would do a great job at this. <laughs> it, it may end up with uh, like creepy-looking hands or teeth or something else. That's that's what he's into right now. But <laughs> or, or, or Minecraft related. I don't know. I think it'd be <laughs> awesome. Like it, uh, uh, it's a flywheel with teeth. I'm I'm kind of into it. Like, it sounds almost like a weapon. Kinda cool. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> a flywheel with a flywheel with teeth is probably a really good logo for for cost optimization. Really, uh, it, I like this. 
It's very, very true. I, th- I think we yeah. have something here. It's, it's, let's yeah. make this happen. Let's. I will. I will definitely put this on as, as the podcast mm-hmm. show title or cover. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's funny to me the pie ops conversation because you guys all have the same experiences with it that I do. That the database people always want pie ops, and then you're like, no, no, you don't need it. I'm like, no, no, we have to have it. And then you're like, well, fine, we'll let you do it. And then every time it's like, see, you didn't really need it. You're just, you're just fooling yourself on what you think your database actually needs or doesn't need. It's, the reality is, is that most databases don't have that need for sustained throughput at that level, They're the burstable capabilities. Most of the disk systems are adequate enough to handle those bursts. There's, I think, in what my eight, nine, nine years, wow, of being of dealing with the cloud, maybe more than that. I think I've only ever actually told a customer this is a use case for PyOps, Pi and it was like some weird legacy product that they were running, you know, some custom built thing, and they were just killing GP2 at the time. But I've, besides that, I've just never seen a use case where it's actually been necessary. All right, well, read the cost observation flywheel. Either agree with Jonathan or don't. You can tweet at him at, at Twitter <laughs> that you disagree with his opinion. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, I agree the FNAF stuff is more mature. Um, but yeah, again, for people new to the space who don't know what the FNAF Foundation is, which you should, uh, I think it's it's not a terrible starting place. And the fact they do admit that they have other programs, because I, you know, the fact that EA has existed was sort of like this big secret for a long time. Like, oh, you have to talk to your account rep because they have, they have specials that get you. It's like, they have an EA agreement. They will give you special pricing. Like, why are you to be so secretive about it? And yes, you have to spend a bajillion dollars with them to get the EA agreement. But if you spend that kind of money with them, it's going to be a good deal for you. All right. Well, I think it's it for this week. Another fantastic week in the cloud, guys. See you all next week. See you later. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. And that is The Week in Cloud. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Foghorn Consulting. Subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and tweet us your feedback at hashtag thecloudpod. Or join our Slack channel. Go to our website, thecloudpod.net, for sign-up instructions.